That Sunday, I went into school, probably got there about 9.30 or so, and I was alone. I worked there for probably an hour and then went to the bathroom to the teacher's lounge and didn't see anybody in the hallways, didn't see anything suspicious. And right when I came out, there he was with a gun in my face and I just shut down. Just terrifying. Yeah. This case really rocked this town back in 97 when it happened. Amy was a school teacher. She's such a really beloved person around these parts. She didn't have any enemies. She wasn't involved in any kind of high-risk behavior. So where do you even start to look for who did this? It was a Sunday morning, broad daylight, when there was a church service in progress in the school. It's almost as if he was watching her. You know, it sounds like he really knew his way around this school. It was really a shocking crime. Like a worst nightmare type of scenario. The whole time, all I could think of was, I just need to do whatever I can do to go home alive and safe. He's a scary offender and took a lot of careful measures to make sure that he didn't leave behind fingerprints and other kinds of evidence. Thankfully, we do have DNA evidence. DNA was recovered in this case, and dozens of suspects were compared. That profile was entered into the national database, and even after 17 years, there haven't been any matches. The offender just gotten better at hiding forensic evidence. I think that this is going to be um, a very challenging case. rape kit represents a person waiting for answers. The biggest reason we're doing this is to bring these survivors some justice. How are you guys? Russ Allen. Nice to meet you. Alicia Sergeant Sergeant Allen. Larry Taylor. So you guys have been working on this case for many, many years? Yes. Yes. Too many yeah. years. Okay. It's a massive case. So. This is one of the worst rape cases that um, I've known about in my career. This didn't just affect Amy, it affected the whole community. We're really excited to be working on this case with you guys. Well, we're glad to have you. My hope is that Alicia and Casey can investigate you, this huh? case with a fresh set of eyes. Oh, what a beautiful room. They're very seasoned investigators, so we're hoping they can help us figure this out. Jesse, hi. hi. How are you? Good, Good to see you again. Good. Yeah, Good. great. Everybody, this is uh, Chief Hayes Miner. Hello. Hi, Chief. Hi. Casey Garrett, thanks for being here. Nice to meet you. This case is very important to me. I've been with this agency for a little over 21 years. I was there at the police department on the day of the incident. And knowing Amy, not only was she a police officer's wife, but it's someone that I knew personally. I've been haunted by it over the years. Well, we've all been pouring over your binders. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming down looking at it, so hopefully we can get it closed. Let's get some stuff up on the board here about our case. At the time of the offense, she was 27 years old. She was a third grade teacher. She was married to Andrew, who is a former Rogers Police Department officer. And she's currently now a practicing attorney, is that right? Yes. She was attending University of Arkansas um, in the evening. Let's talk about the offense. Was at Frank Tillery Elementary School. Yes. Do you guys have those 911 calls by any chance? Yes. Great. 911 calls can really be useful evidence. This is when Amy would have remembered everything that happened to her most viscerally. It's almost like being able to go back and talk to Amy right after the assault occurred. You guys ready? Yes. Okay, 911. What is your emergency? This is Amy. I just molested at my school. What happened? <laughs>
pretty powerful. Yes, excuse me for just one second. I gotta... The 911 call was very intense because it just absolutely transported you back in time to a 27-year-old who was horribly and evilly attacked. Mm. Well, that was actually sort of shocking. I, uh, you know. Just the sheer fear in Amy's voice. I don't think you have a beating heart if you can listen and not be completely distraught. Did she say, he said I had seen him before? Yes, that's what I picked. Yes. Oh, no, yes, that was did. huge. Said yes. I had seen him before, acted like he knew me. You know, that's not just some random thought she had. That's based on the way he was acting. I think you're going to see that we've had some kind of connection to this guy and that we have overlooked something that will become clear as day. It's only day one, and I'm already so frustrated. It just seems like he vanished. Now that we know more about the case, it's time to meet Amy. Hi. How are you? How are you? Good. I'm Casey Garrett. Hi. We want to talk to her about her life after the attack, Hi. and we want to tell her that even though a lot of years have gone by, the Rogers Police Department is still committed to finding her justice. How was your trip down? It was good. Good. Came down yesterday afternoon. Okay. Tell us about your son. You have a teenager. <laughs> I do. He really is a great kid. I feel like we know each other pretty pretty well enough and, and have an open enough relationship. Well, I can relate. I'm a mother of boys, too, so is she. Yeah. Tell me about your law career. When I started law school, I had an internship for the city and just fell in love with it. Now, I'm working as their claims attorney. Okay. So every every angry person <laughs> who's had some issue with the city, they call me. But yeah, we can, you know, do right by lots of people and, and that feels good. I can relate to that. I did an internship at the DA's office and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is where I'm meant to be. But I just have to say, as a former prosecutor and as a woman and a human being, there's something about your case that is just it's a gut punch. These guys and the guys before them have just worked your case tirelessly. And it's just been incredibly frustrating to look at a case like this that's so brazen and then to just feel like the perpetrator has vanished into thin air. Amy and I are the same age. We're both lawyers. She's a mother. I'm a mother. I do feel a connection to her. In the investigation, these guys really vetted any male that had contact with the school, the custodians, the kitchen staff. You saw your perpetrator enough to have recognized whether or not it would have been one of those men? <laughs> you know, being in such a panic at the time was keeping me from, you know, really making any connection. Right. And being a cop's wife, knowing I needed to pay attention to certain things, it was like I was able to focus in on his description and the description of the gun that was in my face. You know, when he said, do you recognize my voice? I'm intensely trying to focus on that. But um, other than just thinking the whole time, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Everything else seems sort of surreal and, and outside the box. After the incident, um, the PTA at Tillery you know, they, they were just trying their, their best to, to help me. They revamped the whole teacher's lounge, and, you know, I'll be forever grateful for their efforts there, you know, to try and make me feel comfortable right. coming back into school there. But um, I just, I couldn't go back in there. And uh, I ended up just um, changing elementary schools. I was really paranoid. I just went into school, went home, didn't, you know, go out and do a whole bunch of anything. The Victims Reparations Board paid for me to go to counseling, right. which made a huge difference. In All states have a program that allocates funds to rape victims for counseling. But unfortunately, many rape survivors don't know that this service could be available to them. It is, you know, something that maybe late at night I think about and I feel that same pain and I cry about it, but, um, you know, it's really hard to push through all of that. After meeting Amy and seeing the pain that she's been living with for 17 years just makes it so much more real than reading a case file. It really frustrates me that her rapist identity is still a mystery. We really want to give her that answer. We're so impressed by your bravery to do this. I know it's not easy. The next woman down the line, I wouldn't want it to happen to her. Wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. A lot of victims, they're embarrassed. Yeah. They don't want to go to the police department and tell somebody what happened to you. You're a pretty brave person for doing it, and I appreciate that. He said that I knew him or that he knew me or had seen me, that in some way we've had some kind of contact. After, I just ran into the library, and I just broke down sobbing and said, 
Call the police, call the police, I've been raped. So this is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to because we have no known suspect. After meeting with Amy, now we want to sit down with detectives and go through the facts we do know about her case. You never know what's going to be important in finding a new lead. We know that he's a white male, 20 to 30 years old. About 5'9 to 6 foot tall. Okay. He's kind of a medium to stocky build, several days growth. She describes it as strawberry blonde. She said that he had a flat nose, not round, and a little wide. Okay. Let's talk about his clothes, too. Yeah, jeans with a hole in them. He had the dirty white socks. No shoes and dirty socks. That's right. I mean, that's a very detailed description. One other thing that we thought was odd is he uh, has her bite his penis. Biting the penis. Is there anything we're leaving out? Had a gun. Remember? Yes, gun. The fact that Amy's attacker carried a gun with him makes us really wonder whether or not he planned the attack. This guy was really conscious about not leaving any marks where he went. You know, at some point, you know, Amy feels a wet substance on her leg, wipes it off, and that's where we get the DNA from her shirt. You're talking about a time where he wouldn't have really thought as much about DNA as an offender would now. Right. So he was certainly not as careful about leaving behind DNA. That DNA sample allowed the police to develop a DNA profile for this unknown suspect. 2003 was really, that was the big year for us, you know, because we were facing the statute of limitations, and so we went for a John Doe DNA warrant. The statute of limitations on rape in Arkansas is six years. The John Doe warrant is something that allows police to charge an individual, even though they haven't yet identified them, as long as they have some piece of identifying information, like their DNA profile. Charges are filed against that person, and whenever you catch them, you're able to bring them to trial for the offense they committed. That's incredibly progressive, and it, I mean, it saved your ability to prosecute this case. What was your role when you made the scene back in 97? Initially, you know, the, our, the focus was on the processing of the crime scene. And then as witnesses started coming forward, we started getting the reports of the blue truck. The blue truck that witnesses believe the attacker was driving that day was really a vital lead in the early stages of the investigation. But over the years, it hasn't brought the police any closer to solving this case. So it's really something we want to focus on again. Larry Wright, a witness, saw blue truck leave at the same time the guy would have ran out the door. I thought it'd be good to talk to him. But over the years, he may recall something that he hadn't reported back then. When you do a cold case investigation, there's always a chance for something to fall through the cracks. You can't rely on what other people have done. You gotta go back to the beginning and you have to do the investigation all over again. So you guys had a pretty developed suspect early on. Initially, the focus was on Frank Schreffler. I thought we had our guy. He worked at the school. He was a cafeteria manager at the time. A lot of things seemed to fit. According to a lot of people at the school, Frank was creepy. He was always hitting on the teachers. Frank had all access to that school. He could walk in whenever he wanted, conduct whatever business he wanted to conduct and leave, and he, probably nobody would know about it. As we continued to look at him, he was horrible in an interview. Everything that we have come up with has been an indication that you could have done this. Very nervous. I am scared that you guys might think I'm guilty and try to arrest me for it, and that, that bothers me, so. Okay. Um, I guess those answers just didn't add up. One of the things you told me is that you had gone to Missouri between 11.30 and 12.15. We had viewed the tape at Don State Line store, and it did not show you being there between that time. Okay. Right. So they put him at the top of the list. When we were serving the search warrant on Frank's house, we found a pair of white underwear underneath the bookcase in his bedroom. Like, oh my gosh, this is the golden egg, right? And yeah, Amy looked at him, no, not mine. And then he was ultimately excluded with DNA. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. There's just so much to that guy that um, I'm flabbergasted, honestly, when that DNA came back, that that was not our guy. Last year, we ran a couple news stories on the local news explaining the case. Rogers police reopening a cold case into the rape of an elementary school teacher. Police are looking for the public's help and putting the suspect behind bars. We tried to release the details of what happened. I'm asking her to bite his penis. We'd held back a lot of these details, you know, to be used in a potential interview, you know, if that should ever occur. But at this point, what we've got to lose, we've got DNA. Right. There's one tip that I have not eliminated yet. A guy by the name of Craig. When we ran it in the news, we had a caller call in and report that she had dated a guy who had some of the same sexual habits that this offender had. He has not been talked to. He has not been eliminated. Do you know what he looks like? Does he fit the description? I do. He does fit the description. He has no arrest, so he has not had any DNA on file. He works for the city um, just south of here, so I think I can just call to see if he's working. If just run down there, do an interview with him, just see if he'll consent. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a great game plan.
while Detective Taylor tries to track Craig down. All right, we're here. Oh, okay. Sergeant Allen and I are going to go talk to Larry Wright, the witness that saw the blue truck on the day of the attack. I looked out toward the smaller parking lot, and that's when I saw the male pulling off in a pickup truck. And where was the truck leaving from? Pulling out toward the east. And I think that's all I can say with any certainty. Even though Larry didn't have any additional information, the blue truck is still a significant fact that could lead to new suspects in the case. Ready. Just to double check, you know, consent forms. Got swabs, got some envelopes to put them in. Approaching somebody face to face and telling them that they're a suspect in a serious criminal investigation is always a really tricky thing to do. How you doing, sir? Are you Craig? Do I need a lawyer envelope? No, you have every right to one. You're not in any trouble. You're never really sure how the person will react. Back in 1997, we had an incident involving a teacher. Could you tell me who brought my name on? It was anonymous. There were just some concerns. They brought your so name they up. Could thought just maybe make you... up something right now. They, they could, and that's why we're talking to you. Let me just get some information. Where did you go to school? Um, ULA, this is a pretty important piece of information. We know Amy was going to the University of Arkansas at the time of her attack in 1997, and since the attacker acted like he knew her, they could have crossed paths there. Would you be willing to consent to a DNA sample? It's not no, going into a not system. Yet. I mean, um, you're not obligated to. It just helps us write you off. I don't know. I mean, I don't like. I thought it, you, know, you know, if we don't get a DNA sample from this guy, it's just another unanswered question for these investigators. It's the easiest way to cross you off, man. You know, so if somebody yeah. put your name in it, they'll compare it at the lab, and we can ask them to destroy your sample afterwards. Do you, do you mind? I or, don't like the thought of it, you know. You know, it makes our job easier, so I don't have to put time into you and go, maybe this is a viable suspect. Right. I'll take one from each side, each cheek here. Just because somebody voluntarily gives you their DNA doesn't mean they didn't do it. All right, have a good day. Thank you, sir. I've certainly seen people who couldn't wait to give a sample who were guilty of sin. Uh, and he's got the habits. I like it. Yeah, it's crazy when he said U of A. I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Makes you raise an eyebrow, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. What happened? The guy was standing there with a gun. He made me take off all my clothes. I'd been violated. And I wasn't sure what to do. I just wanted to cocoon up and just let the world pass by for a while. But I really wanted to catch this guy. I was mad. I was scared, scared, and mad. Working with the Rogers Police Department, we've tracked down Craig. Would you be willing to consent to a DNA sample? A lead that came from a recent anonymous tip. We've sent off his DNA for analysis. In the meantime, we're going to review the geography of the crime scene to better understand how the crime unfolded. So Amy would have been um, sitting that Sunday morning working in her classroom, grading papers, and doing her normal thing. This is going to be Amy's classroom. Okay. At some point, she came out and walked down this hallway and in through here into the restroom. That's the teacher's lounge. And so then this is going to be the restroom where the first part of the sexual assault occurred. And that's where her sandals were found. And then he directs her up the stairs into this room. That's right. So there's the stairwell. There's the door there. It just seems like he really had to know her habit of being there. So this is the room where the second part of the incident occurred. Right. It's certainly more secluded. Amy says that a suspect fled this direction east. It would have went right towards the blue truck. That gives me a better feel for how it happened. Mm -hmm. Seeing the crime scene video was really very emotional. As a mom, I just can't understand what Amy went through being violated in a place that should have been a safe haven. The video does give us a better understanding of the progression of the attack. And so now we want to talk to witnesses that may have seen the attacker that morning. I was going to church and I did see like a guy walking around the school. You know, it just struck me. Why would he be at the school on a Sunday? He had like white brown hair. He was like a medium to heavy built. And I thought he was probably early 20s. Do you remember doing the composite of the guy? I do remember. Okay. Our church services in the cafeteria. My daughter and I were walking in, and I just noticed this guy looking at my daughter in kind of a leery grin. 
And I'm going to say probably early to mid 20s, big shoulders, kind of a big guy. Okay. And they drew a composite picture. The witness descriptions seem very consistent, and the Rogers Police Department did a very good job of getting composite sketches from all of those witnesses. We want to review those composites to see if we can find any new clues about the suspects. The faces it's all look very similar. It's, it's the eyes. I think we need to find her information. People are most accurate about this part of the face. Oh, interesting. And so, like, that's what you should look at to compare. Who's Erin Duty? She did a sketch. I have no idea. She had seen a guy that matched his description a couple weeks before the rape incident. We've looked through all the sketches that we knew about, but it looks like we may have just discovered a witness who made a sketch that we hadn't heard about. Fortunately, by looking through the file, we know how to get in touch with her. Would you have some time that you could be with us? And we're able to track her down. Can you just tell me what you remember? Me and my sister are sitting on the front porch over at our church. And this guy pulled up in this blue truck with a white top. A witness saw Blue Truff leave at the same time the guy would have ran out the door. Guessing on the body style, I would say it was probably like 80 something. And he came up to us, started talking to us. He seemed like 20s, maybe early 30s. And what color was his hair? It was like a light brown or a blonde. Had you seen this guy before or again? No, I hadn't. Truck? No. Do you remember if he told you his name? Casey. Oh, awesome. This is a pretty incredible development. Erin Duty may have given us a new suspect to investigate. She witnessed somebody driving a blue truck that was very similar to the one Larry Wright described that the attacker was driving that morning. And now we just might have a name to go with that truck. After being scared and looking over my shoulder, you know, I just got to a point where I said, I cannot keep living like this. I did nothing to ask for it. I did nothing to deserve it. And I'm just not going to let him take control over my life. After pouring through the Rogers Police Department files, we've developed a new lead about who could be responsible for Amy's attack. Me and my sister are sitting on the front porch over at our church. And this guy pulled up in this blue truck with a white top. Aaron Duty had told the police about a strange man that she'd seen around the time of the attack, and his description matches our rapist. His vehicle also matched the one that was seen leaving the school that day. And Aaron gave us one other key piece of information. Do you remember if he told you his name? Casey. Oh, awesome. Which gives us a way to possibly track him down. I think we're going to call on ACIC today, seeing if they can track Chevrolet pickups from 1997 registered to anybody with first name of Casey. While the Rogers Police Department requests records on the suspect's vehicle, we want to revisit the theory that the attacker might actually have known Amy. Hey, did he know you? <laughs> I had seen him before. With his free access to the school, it is possible that Amy's attacker could have worked there. Miss Wilbanks. Yes, sir. Hey, it's Russ from the police station. Yes. Johnny Wilbanks was the principal of Frank Tillery Elementary back in 1997 and would have had first-hand knowledge of the people that worked there at the time. I guess we'll start out with how were people reacting after this happened. My staff, while we wanted to help, and it still felt like a very personal thing that was happening to each of us. Someone who worked in our cafeteria, actually he was the manager, was a suspect. And uh, that felt very uncomfortable. Did you ever see anyone around the school that, that shouldn't be there? Uh, one thing that I do remember, this just really was creepy. The office aide, she was here in the building on that Sunday in the morning. She had forgotten something in her desk. As she was turning that corner, the cafeteria guy, Frank, she almost ran straight into him. There was no reason for him to be in this building. But even more odd than him being in here was that he had no shoes on. <laughs> the lack of shoes on the perpetrator is such a distinct part of the attack. So to hear that Frank Schreffler was in the school that morning with no shoes on is astonishing. What is her name, the office aide's name? Kelly James. DNA or no DNA, this is something we need to confirm. I think we're obligated to call Kelly, oh, yeah, especially the fact that who gave us the information. Hello? Hello, is this Kelly? Yeah. 
Kelly, hey, this is Detective Taylor with the Rogers Police Department. I am working an investigation regarding an incident that happened back in 1997 at the school, and I understand you used to work there, and I just had a few questions. Uh, you got just a minute? I did have a couple weird things happen. I forgot my sunglasses in the office in my desk, and when I was coming in the front door, the guy that worked in the cafeteria came around the corner and kind of scared me. I thought it was so weird that he was up there and he wasn't wearing any shoes. Was you working that day or was you at home? Oh, no, it was and just... a Saturday morning. Yeah, you see, that's a Saturday. Uh -huh. um, was that before or after the incident with the teacher? It was before. But it was not the same day of the incident? No, no, no. Though there's a discrepancy between Johnny and Kelly's timelines, the fact that Frank was in the school without his shoes on cannot be overlooked. We've been investigating this for 18 years. That would be some information that we would need to know. Is that something that was not reported back then, or is that just something we haven't found the report to? It didn't sound like she had told anybody about this. What was his cooperation level with the police? I think he got an attorney right away. But he gave a buckle? I think they ended up getting a search warrant. Is he not on that list of exclusions? Yeah, he's on the list, but I don't have the report that actually excludes him. While the police do have Frank listed as excluded in some of their reports, we can't find the actual report where the lab excluded him. I need the original, his original submission. Is it possible maybe something could be wrong with his DNA? Or, I mean, maybe oh, it's sure something you. that didn't get processed and we think did? Given what we've just learned, until we can find Frank's DNA exclusion, it looks like he's back on our suspect list. We've been reviewing the Rogers Police Department investigation of Frank Schreffler, an early suspect in Amy's 1997 assault. The principal of the school mentioned that Frank was very strange. The way that Johnny describes Frank, he bothered all the Everybody. teachers. He certainly would have bothered Amy because he was trying to get all the teachers to date him. Would Amy recognize Frank in just sunglasses and a hat? The person that assaulted Amy was wearing a skull cap and sunglasses. So it is possible even if she knew him, he wasn't easily identified. Frank, hey, this is Detective Taylor with the Rogers Police Department. What we're doing is kind of starting from the beginning on this case. Yeah, uh, uh, situation at the Rogers School? Yes. Really? Yeah. Can you just kind of tell me what you remember about that back in 1997? When I went into work, I remember seeing police officers uh, in the hallway. All of a sudden, they thought uh, I had something to do with it. I remember them coming to my house and taking my socks, sunglasses, I remember them uh, asking for DNA, calling me in and telling me they thought I did it. I remember losing my job, my girlfriend, uh, my apartment, and then I'm moving out of uh, uh, the Arkansas area. How well did you know Amy back then? Um, can you kind of tell me about her? Um, she was a taller blonde lady, kind of pretty. Somebody had reported you was in the school at one time in socks. I don't remember ever being in socks. Was you using drugs back then? Yeah, okay. yeah, I was. Did you have anybody else in the school with you that would have been familiar with the school? Or I took one of my uh, uh, lady friends uh, to the school one time, and uh, I remember us uh, doing sex there. Okay. Well, Frank, I appreciate your time, you know, trying to resolve this case, so. Uh, I'm pretty upset right now just reliving it. Many of the things that Frank Scheffler was telling us were kind of odd until we can verify he was eliminated by DNA in this case. We have to still look at him as a suspect. ACIC did get back with me on the pickup trucks belonging to Casey. And so there were some hits? I think there was one. Oh. Information we uncovered from a witness in the case gave us a new name to investigate in Amy's sexual assault. We came down to Casey. He was born in 74, so he would have been the right age range. Right, about 23. There was an 87 Chevrolet pickup that was blue. Wow. Really? A good reason why he would not have reoffended was because he killed himself in 98. Wow. Whoa. In Bella Vista. A little more irony is I used to work at Bella Vista before I worked here for a couple of years, and I'm pretty sure I remember going on that call. I was the first one. There You're too. kidding. Wow. Given the fact that rapists are often repeat offenders, we wondered why we had never gotten a hit on the John Doe profile. But if the offender had died, that would explain it. What are his other descriptors? 5'10", 
Blue eyes, looks like he's got brown hair. He's got a little bit of face stubble. So it may be the Casey that the duties saw. That's good old fashioned police work right there. This description is quite similar to the witness accounts. And in conjunction with the blue truck and Aaron Duty's statement, this could be our best lead yet. Because Casey died by suicide, we want to visit the county coroner's office to see if there's any blood or tissue samples on him that would allow us to test his DNA. I was able to find that to file from 1998. The deputy coroner or the coroner did not draw blood. There was no toxicology, no autopsy. It's a one-page document and the death certificate. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Without something from the coroner's office, we're going to have to find a different way to get his DNA. We need to run up to Hiawassee to try to make contact with his parents and maybe get a swab from his dad. What are your thoughts? Um, probably just you going in there, right? I wouldn't mind having one of you in there. Okay. If we could get DNA from Casey's father, we could compare it to the John Doe DNA profile. My most important goal is to get that swab. While it won't be an exact match, YSTR, or male family line testing, will tell us if Casey's father is related to the assailant, similar to what they do in paternity testing. Okay. Hello, sir. I'm Sergeant Allen from the Rogers Police Department. Nice to meet you, sir. Hi. I'm Jesse Alvarado. Can we have just a few minutes of your time? Yeah. We're looking into an old case back in Rogers, back in 1997, okay? We just had a couple of questions in, in, involving Casey. Uh, you had a, a blue truck back then? Do you remember? He, he had owned a S10 Chevrolet. Okay. I'm not so much concerned about the truck any longer. It was just who may have been driving the truck in the day. The only way for us to clear the, the truck and maybe him would be for us to get some type of DNA from him. Okay, and I recognize that he's no longer here, but one way that we can do that is if we were to take a sample of your DNA, I'm able to say if it was related because he was your son. So it would be a matter of just giving a little saliva sample and, and we would be on our way. Uh, you're telling me what kind of case you're talking about. This was a case where, where someone was, was assaulted. He didn't assault somebody, I'll guarantee it. The only way that I'm gonna be able to take his name off the case as a suspect is if I get some type of DNA sample from you. We have a victim out there who deserves to, to know what happened. You're not getting no DNA from Okay, that's fine. We appreciate your time. I don't know whose cigarette I have. I have somebody's. Did you see him smoking? I saw him smoking. Okay, that's his. I saw you bend down. Did you drop your glasses? Yeah. Is that what you did? Okay. Once Casey's father dropped the cigarette, it was discarded, allowing the police to gather that evidence. Jesse's quick thinking just got us that DNA sample we needed. Now we'll know if Casey was involved in Amy's rape. Yes, Jesse. After days of working with the Rogers Police Department investigating the 1997 sexual assault of Amy, who was a school teacher back then, we have two new leads in the case, Craig and Casey. And there's an old suspect from the case that has landed back in our investigation, cafeteria manager Frank Schreffler. The fact that he had been seen without shoes kind of make you wonder if, in fact, could he possibly be related to this case. It is such specific and strange behavior to be out of school when you're not supposed to be with no shoes on, and that's something that the perpetrator did. I mean, that's very specific. Frank was originally thought to be cleared by DNA, but when we realized we were missing the state lab report that excluded him as a suspect, we needed to reinvestigate. We just want to verify by looking at the evidence itself so that we can make sure that we understand in the reports where he was excluded. And I think Larry and Russ are going to go down to the evidence room and physically look at the vial of blood that was taken from Frank and verify how it was labeled so that we can compare it to those lab reports. But we have to make sure. You guys were maybe going to go down to the evidence room. Did that this morning. Awesome. Oh, wow. Awesome. The update on that is uh, Frank Scheffler's box is labeled K3. In the DNA report, the state crime lab excludes K3 from the mixture on the sweatshirt and the t-shirt. He's excluded, excluded, excluded. There's no question there's a reason why this department suspected him, you know, and that was fair. He had some very inexplicable behavior, which is why you guys looked at him so hard. But DNA cuts both ways. I mean, it's just as important for DNA to get suspicion off of a person as it is to convict the guilty. 
With Frank Streffler definitively cleared by DNA, all that remains is for us to call Sorensen and get the results for Craig and for Casey's dad. Hello, this is Kenny. This is Alicia. I'm here with the investigators in Rogers, Arkansas. Hi, Alicia. So we hear that you might have an update for us on the DNA. Yes, on Craig. The DNA is excluded. Okay. On Casey's father, both he and his son Casey are excluded. Wow. Well, I'm sorry that we couldn't get a match to the evidence on this case. All right. Thank you so much, Cammy. Bye. Bye-bye. This is disappointing because we were so hoping to be able to put this to rest for Amy. You know, in a perfect world, we'd have somebody in custody right now. But unfortunately, all we can do now is tell her what we found so far. Well, Great to see, see you, ladies. You. We can tell Amy today, though, that there's definitely hope for the future. We've had a very productive stay here. We've gotten a lot done. We've been, you know, vetting all week, and unfortunately, we couldn't find the perpetrator. But one thing that's very important is to exclude people. Right. You know, that's closure, too. And these guys are never going to let it drop as long as they're on the job and they're very invested in this, as are we. Maybe this whole process might generate some more information, especially when they're able to put a face with this crime. Um, somebody might realize that they really need to come forward. Yeah, that'd be great. This case is such a gut punch because it has remained unsolved for all these years. I'm really hoping that Amy can find some solace, though, in our commitment to keep investigating her case. It feels like we're just getting so close, and it may just be a matter of time, just the right dot being connected, and I'm just so... <sighs> I can hold out hope that there's going to be a match eventually, and I don't want to hide from it because it is a part of the story of my life. But another thing that I also can't stress enough is just what you have to tell other people. Gosh, to any survivor right now, I would say that tomorrow is going to come and it will be okay. Fight. Don't let it get you down. Don't take on that person's shame that they tried to lay on you because it's not yours. You know, if nothing else comes of this, I feel like, you know, God has a purpose for for your story and for you. I know that I would have regretted this the rest of my life if I hadn't participated. This is part of my story, and if it helps someone else along the way, then even better. I believe it will. Okay. We will be in touch. Thank you again for everything. Man, I wanted to solve it. I think this is going to be one of those cases that I think about and just continuously go over it in my head and try to figure out who could have done this to Amy because she deserves to know. If you have any information regarding this suspect, please contact the Rogers Police.